I would like to call the Community Services and Infrastructure Committee meeting of March 6 to order. I would like to begin by reading a safety notice. In the event of an emergency, please evacuate council chambers to the nearest exit through the chamber doors and obey all instructions given by our deputy clerk this evening. If assistance is required, please see the deputy clerk. Once you have evacuated the building, please gather in the front parking lot outside of town hall. Also, the Town of Lincoln Committee and Council meetings are posted on YouTube channel. Uh, we have no public here this evening. Um, we have no delegations. Um, I ask Council to please um, remember to silence all cellular devices, which I made the uh, mistake of at the 4 o'clock meeting. I apologize. Uh, roll call. We have all of Council this evening, uh, except Councilor Rinjima had, uh, had to leave, so she is absent. And we have staff here this evening. Thank you for your attendance. Uh, we have, uh, are there any declarations of interest? Seeing none, uh, there are no st statutory public meetings on the agenda. Uh, we have no delegations this evening. Uh, we have no, we have no consent, consent agenda. So moving to our regular agenda, we have an additional item that we would like to add to the regular agenda. Uh, there will be a motion to waive the, there, uh, there will be a motion to waive the rules and add a late addition to the agenda as 7.1. So this is for a motion regarding the Town of Lincoln's resolution uh, to be delivered to the Niagara Region's consideration regarding recycling waste collection. So I need to read the motion. Yes, so so this is going to this is going to bump into seven one that will become seven two. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, um, um, Councillor Russell, we'll be we'll be bringing this motion forward this evening. Uh, so, in order for us to move this item to be added, uh, we will require a two thirds vote. Uh, so now I need to read the motion. Not yet. Oh f yes, yes. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You know, I should remember this from our training because we moved around and did some of this stuff, right? Um, so we need a two-thirds. We need a two-thirds vote. All in favor? So there we go. All in favor. We have uh, we have approval to move forward. So we have a notice of motion brought forward by Councillor Russell for consideration uh, this evening. So I'm going to read the motion. Uh, whereas the region of Niagara, our municipality of, where is the region of the municipality? I think we're, are we, should that say Niagara or? Yes. Whereas the region of the municipality of Niagara is undergoing a comprehensive review of its waste management practices. And whereas municipalities in the Niagara region currently have plastic and paper recycling being placed at the curb in an open box style containers, and whereas the town of Lincoln received correspondence from the city of Thorold, indicating that it had submitted comments to the waste management review process, requesting that measures to be taken to contain plastic and paper recycling, uh, that recycling that it is placed on the curb in open containers. Whereas the town of Lincoln receives complaints from residents regarding the amount of recycling material that spills and becomes refuse and litter. And whereas the region of Niagara collects and sells a portion of the recycling, but is not able to sell any contents that are lost and is therefore losing revenue as a result. Finally, the town of Lincoln requests that during its review of its waste management practices, that the region consider both interim and long-term measures to contain recycling materials that are put to the curb awaiting pickup. Councillor Russell, would you like to speak to this motion?
Ah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <laughs> Um, this was something that has come up uh, quite a bit in Ward 1, and I'm sure uh, it's happened in other wards as well. Um, over the years, uh, it's been brought to our attention, to Councilor and Gemma's attention uh, as well, in her tenure that we do get a lot of south-north winds, uh, and I don't know if it's because it's coming off of the escarpment, but we do find that we have quite a bit of blowing uh, recycling throughout a lot of neighborhoods, particularly through main corridors that run south north. So again, like Ontario Street, Lincoln Ave. Um, and again, we thought it was a great consideration for staff uh, and uh, to go to the region and have them consider while they're making their, uh, their grander plan to think about ways of enclosing some of that recycling to, uh, again, mitigate some of that uh, loss. Again, I know it's lost revenue for them potentially, but also again, the overall beautification of our neighborhoods, again, it, it does have an impact on that, so. Just a consideration for them. Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Russell, for bringing that forward for Councillor Benjamin in her absence. I don't see anyone uh, else on the mic here. So, uh, so all in favor? Oops. Thank you, Mary Mr. Stanley. Chairman. I just wanted to um, comment that, um, without advancing this too much. Um, I believe that the question was asked about closed containers. You're not suggesting anything like that. But um, when the report comes back, <clears throat> maybe the circumstances and some of the decision making may even have changed at the region. If staff would please consult to find out where they're at. Um, because um, I believe they said that they weren't going to have closed containers to tops because of cost. Um, but um, there may be some other solutions. So I, I'd like to know what it is, where they're at, at the moment that we have that report come forward. I don't know whether staff any, have any further information on this at all, but I'm happy to wait until the report comes. That was just the point I wanted to make. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, through you to staff, uh, should should um, the region not entertain the idea of covered um, refuse containers and this and that? Is this something that we can implement ourselves uh, as a municipality? Um, is it is this some? Should this not go through, or should this not be entertained by the region? Is this something that we as, as a as a town can uh, implement? Mr. Graham, could you comment on that, please? Uh, thank you, through you, Mr. Chairman, to the councillor. I think it would be difficult for the town to, to implement that specifically because <clears throat> since waste collection is, is managed by the region in terms of the service delivery of the contract, um, it may require um, different uh, requirements with how they're collecting it with their contracts. So I think that would be might be difficult if we were to say, um, we're going to implement that. Um, I think what we want to do, though, is, is continue to push the region to look at what others are doing. I know um, the region has made indications to staff that they are looking at what other municipalities are doing in this regard, whether it's a lid or a, a different type of bag within the box, but um, and looking at, you know, can we pilot something in, in our community, perhaps? Um, you know, and so the region have been supportive of that idea, but that's really all we, we really have to report at the moment. But they, they're hearing it from other municipalities, uh, not just ourselves, so. Okay, so, so essentially the, the garbage and trash that is collected in the region is your concern is not really any of our business. It's, it's the fire department and the garbage collection. Sorry, I'm Okay, sorry about that. Um, I'll repeat that. But so really, the trash business is not our business as a as a municipality. It's the region sets the rules and sets the uh, guidelines that we we taxpayers within the municipality follow. That's Through you, Mr. Chairman, I mean, ge generally speaking, they're, they're delivering that service for across Niagara within our community. Um, 
but I think the motion tonight is, is a great message to send the region formally that is something that, you know, we want looked at for Lincoln, Thorold saying it. Um, yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Thanks. That's all. And, and I think that was really the intention of Councillor Rinjima that while the, uh, the region had made it clear that they were looking for feedback while this study was going on and when she noticed that the city of Thorold had chimed in, she, she thought that it was an appropriate time. So that's really the reason for the motion and I thank Councillor Russell for bringing it forward. So, um, Mary Easton. Well, thank you for recognizing me, Mr. Chair. Um, I also, um, think that maybe we could ask staff to also add in this report um, what the costs are for picking up litter. Because we do have, in those shoulder seas, and it's my understanding that we still utilize public work staff to go out and pick up litter. <clears throat> and there was, and, and also there was a frost, a snow fence that was positioned at the corner of number of, um, Bartlett Road and John Street just prior to the winter for the express reason that it catch the garbage in the subdivisions that were to the, w to the west, to the northwest, or the southwest. So I think that um, it really became quite an, an issue because that field was in very, very bad shape. So there, again, there's staff that have to go in there and do that at a time when we're getting ready for you know, there's other fall activities, other maintenance activities, other important issues. So I wouldn't like to, us to see ha ourselves having to add more for litter pickup unnecessarily. I, I, if there is a way to quantify that, I think it would be beneficial. It would be beneficial for the region to hear that we're having to have additional costs. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. So we are now considering uh, item 7.2. No, we need to vote. There we go. Yes. Move a mover for this motion. Councillor Timmers. All in favor? Anyone opposed? Seeing none. Thank you. We are now considering item 7.2, PW-04-19, the 2018 annual summary report for the Beansville distribution system and the Jordan Vineland distribution system. Uh, staff will be providing a presentation. Please come forward, Jillian. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you, Councillors. Um, this is just to provide an overview of uh, the annual reports that were included within the report as well, um, and to kind of highlight some of the, the key areas of the reports. So the agenda for tonight will, um, it's a bit of a lengthy one, will uh, be to review the report structure, then provide an overview of the Beamsville distribution system, and the Jordan Vineland distribution system, legislative compliance that we have, um, flow and loss data, infrastructure overview, um, go over supply and then monitoring improvement, staffing, municipal licensing, uh, drinking water quality management systems, um, which I'll probably refer to as DWQMS um, throughout the presentation, a spotlight on 2019 and then address any questions that we may have. So the report structure when you're going through, um, you'll find that we've included both the Beamsville and the Jordan Vineland in a single report, um, just to simplify things a bit because there's a lot of the same information that would apply to both. Um, supporting information is identified in italics and uh, there is a glossary on page four for some of the terms or our jargon that we like to use. Um, and the Ministry of the Environment, Conservation and Parks, M MECP, the new Ministry of the Environment, or ME, MOE, um, their annual report is also included in the appendix. So to provide an overview of the existing Beamsville distribution system, uh, it services approximately 16,000 people. We have approximately 65 kilometers of water main. We have three pressure zones. 
456 fire hydrants, 556 main valves, so um, those are within the, the road to shut it off and isolate. Um, 14 pressure reducing valve chambers, one booster station with backup generator, that's a, the picture in the side, that's the Hickson um, pumping station that's at the top of Hickson. Uh, one bulk water filling station that's right behind Town Hall. Um, it's currently a class two system and we're anticipating a reclassification following um, Vista Ridge, Cherry Heights and Lincoln Estates developments. Um, it's, the classification is done on a point system and where we'll see the increase will be when we add the additional kilometers. And then we have all of the additional residents online um, with the additional water consumption. The Jordan Vineland um, distribution system services approximately um, 7,500 people, 42 kilometers of water main. Uh, we have four distinct service areas, but only one true pressure zone. Uh, 255 fire hydrants, 266 main valves, uh, two pressure reducing valve chambers. Um, we have two booster pumping stations, they're a lot smaller. Um, that's, this is the one that you'll see off of King Street. Uh, this is the Vinehaven pumping station. We have another one up on Glen Elgin. Um, it's currently a class two system and following the Prudhams development, we're also anticipating that this system will become a class three system. Legislative compliance. Um, so we have to identify consumer complaints as, as part of this um, walkthrough. It follows a similar, um, if you recall your training that we did in late December, there's so many items that we have to hit. This is um, kind of the first one. So consumer complaints. Uh, for both systems total, we received four complaints. Um, three of them had to do with color, odor, and taste. I will note that all three occurred during the winter, during one of our hot seasons. Unfortunately, um, for the region to do the treatment and to meet the levels required, they do have to add a bit more um, chlorine because of the temp um, how the temperature impacts the treatment. Um, we had one pressure complaint and it was um, tied to some issues that we had um, Within, within the pumping station that we addressed briefly. Um, all of these complaints were addressed within 24 hours and all um, color, odor, or taste complaints also get forwarded to the region to log as well. Um, sorry. Our, uh, we do have a QMS procedure in place to follow these issues and we have to investigate them and have a cause and we do have to document these proceedings and present on them yearly during our audit. The next is under regulatory testing. So summary tables one and two in the report to go over this. Um, we had six adverse water quality incidents in Beansville, four in Jordan Vineland. Um, I wanna highlight that these adverse water quality incidents um, are um, tied to, uh, typically tied to operator error or lab error. Um, we have to do a follow-up and do two days of testing afterwards. If something were to occur in those two days following, then it would, it would amplify and we'd have to, to notify the public. These incidents were all considered um, minor incidents and not something that is a true representation of the state of the water. Um, the amount of testing that we do do um, exceeds the regulatory requirements, but it's our due diligence to make sure that um, the system, because we do, it is such broad stretching that we are um, providing safe drinking water for all of our residents. So here is the summary um, for kind of all, all the different testing that we did across. So you'll see that we did just over 2,000 um, tests within the system between both Beansville and Jordan. Um, some of them regu uh, regular, regular, some of them commissioning, um, some of them just uh, maintenance. So if we're doing work um, on the system, changing out a valve, changing out a hydrant, we have to do some testing in those areas. The THMs, HAAs, um, those are um, more so regulatory and it's tied to how um, treatment impacts water as it's flowing through. Those always come back um, completely fine. Lead, um, we have a very small amount. The number will actually decrease um, and I'll talk about that later with the when we reduce the Vineland. Um, West system when we bring that back online. Um, but that, uh, again, following some of the incidents that happened um, in London back in 2007, the lead testing has increased. Um, and then we do additional chlorine residual testing just to make um, throughout every week as well to make sure that everything is safe. So on top of that, we also have every year um, a ministry inspection where they come forward. So in May uh, 14th, they came forward and did the detailed inspection. We received a 100% inspection rating for both systems. They identified no non-compliance items and no recommended improvement items. Um, so a perfect score. And I'd like to um, 
point out to is our operations staff and then um, our regulatory compliance officer have done an excellent job in maintaining our systems and making sure that we are this successful um, through our annual inspections. We also go through um, internal audits and every so many years or every uh, four years we have to go through an external reaccreditation audit. So we had our internal audit this year in June. Uh, we had two major non-conformances. Uh, we had two minor non-conformances and two opportunities for improvement. So this goes more, they do a more deep dive into all of our, our record keeping um, and it's more tied to um, how in depth they want information to be um, for trade or if, um, kind of the exact order of the steps that we went through something matches exactly how our operational plan comes into play. Um, we had the exact same findings, not the same mi minor non-conformances or opportunities for improvements, but the same amount of numbers for our external reaccreditation audit. Um, I should note that we actually addressed all of these items before the auditor even provided their report back to us. So everything was completely resolved um, and addressed before their formal report identifying um, these issues were brought forward. For regulatory updates, um, our drinking water quality management standard, um, the draft update was in uh, 2013 with approval in 2017. Uh, no significant changes that um, affect the town and the audit was completed as per updates. So going over flow data, um, as, oops, there's a bit of an overlap on there, I apologize. Um, since 2010, we've seen um, a decreasing trend in water usage. It did go a little bit up um, this year, but overall a decreasing trend. That's across the board, um, across most um, First Nation countries are finding this. It's mostly due to low flow toilets and um, just people are being a little bit more, more water smart. And um, just expanding on it and breaking it down as to what we see within the trend. So looking at monthly flows, um, as, as would be expected, you expect uh, July peaks um, within the Beansville area. Jordan, we actually had a bit of a, a dip in July and then an increase um, we saw in, in June and, and August. Um, we didn't ha have the need to implement our water use restriction bylaw because we were well within our available flows. Um, so we allowed um, residents, we didn't put any limitations on um, watering of lawns or gardens or anything of the such. So then going on daily flows and seeing where the peaks, again, what you would expect, both of them, we actually did have our peaks, um, even within the Jordan and Vineland. The peak day was in, in July and that's to be expected. It's our typically our hottest and driest month. Going over water loss, um, you will see an increase um, this year, actually over the past two years in our water loss. This is primarily tied to, um, to meter error. Um, and in April, you see it brought forward, um, I think a number are where we will be going through the program to replace all the meters within. A lot of our meters are outside of their accurate reading age um, and we're seeing a significant decline in the accuracy. So they're underestimating how much water is being used. Um, it also, the increase this year is tied to, um, and in later slides you'll see it, we did have an increase in water main breaks um, in some of our older water mains, and I'll be going over, over those. There's a small amount that would be tied to leaks that might be unknown or some illegal connections, but that's not um, really a large issue that's contributing to ours. It's, uh, our goal is to get a back down to below that 10% that like we saw in 2016 and try and maintain it below 10% as that's considered across the board a tight system or you're the managing the amount the water well. Um, then as I mentioned we did have 17 breaks in 2018. Um, it was quite a large spike from 2017. Um, we had nine in Beamsville, eight in Jordan Vineland. Um, there was one on a regional main we tracked that as well but the region would do that repair um, and we didn't have any breaks within the um, Vineland Loss private water system in, in 2018. Um, these breaks all did happen on um, our older water mains and the majority of water mains that these breaks occurred on, the mains are set to be replaced either this year or next year, possibly um, maybe one section of it into 2021, but um, we are addressing uh, the age of the infrastructure and um, the cause of the number of the repairs. So continuing on, um, 
we uh, the town has done an excellent job of replacing uh, metallic pipe. So we do have all cast iron um, eliminated. We have 4.9 um, kilometers of ductile iron, which is set to be um, replaced in the upcoming years. We do have lined cast iron. So while it is a metallic, it is lined with a um, kind of a, a cement resin. Um, so it's the the water that's passing through, it's not deemed um, metallic pipe that it's going through. But So we do have about 10.7% um, remaining of metallic pipe, but it will be um, within the next year, 10 year capital plan, all of those pipes will be, um, will be replaced and upgraded. Um, so our performance metrics, the guys were um, quite busy back there. Uh, we flushed 900 hydrants, operated 250 valves. We did, um, just shy of 2,700 locates. We collected, as was mentioned, over 2,000 samples. Um, we completed 1,100 or 1,145 work orders. I want to note, um, as it goes with the um, meter issues and parlay into this, we actually did over 1,800 independent meter reads last year um, due to issues with the meter reading company and and some other issues. But um, that was a, a large chunk of meter reads. Um, and then on top of that, we had 663. Um, kind of repairs or double check or go out and make sure the touch pads are working. Um, we had the five complaints, um, as was addressed earlier, that we resolved. And then we did um, address the remaining 100 hydrants and did flow testing and color coded. So when you drive down the streets, you'll see um, at nighttime when you're driving, it lights up like Christmas. Um, that is a fire. Um, it, it's to help the firefighters know kind of how much flow they're going to get from each one. So it is a safety factor, but it also lets um, it lets our, our staff know as well that the the hydrants have been tested, they're operational, they're flowing, and they're flowing at a specific amount. So it is a regulatory requirement, but it's also um, for the, the hydrants to be color coded. But then it's also a safety. So we've highlighted it from that point, um, and we inspect inspected 16 of our chambers. So our supply is handled by uh, Niagara Region. Um, I should note that we are part of a working group there with all uh, the other area municipalities are represented. They meet, um, they try to meet monthly. Um, some months it doesn't work out, so it might be um, every other month that they meet. But um, we all talk, um, all the municipalities talk to each other throughout as well with some issues that we might be facing or ideas for improvements. And we do discuss any regulatory or QMS changes and updates. Um, we work together to build um, operational plans and, and guidelines as a group. So we try to keep it consistent across um, Niagara. I'd like to highlight that a lot of municipalities actually utilize um, Town of Lincoln's um, guidelines or SOPs on building and expanding on theirs. Um, and it's intended to generate discussion in the area to improve it overall. Um, the region did complete their master servicing plan in 2017, um, or provided that update. Um, and it does focus on level of service and updates with that. Um, we Back in 2016, there was an update on the memo of understanding with the region and clearly delineated uh, regional and municipal infrastructure and improved communication and service. And we have been working on that uh, um, as well over over the past year or so, trying to, to leverage existing communications or existing relationships with some of the staff as um, key people within the region have been changing. Um, and we've also had some, some changes here trying to utilize those relationships. So monitoring and improvement um, backflow meters. Um, this um, backflow requ requirements were um, were highlighted in our the training that we conducted in um, in December and went over the importance of it. It is um, regulated not only from kind of a, a water side; it's also a building code standard, and there is a CSA um, requirement with it as well. Um, for installation, we have um, we're. 95%, we only have 14 properties remaining. Um, where, we are falter, uh, where, where we are falling behind a little bit is that we only have about 70% compliance with annual testing. Um, and, and we do have some plans moving forward for non-testing compliance um, and, and how we can approach that and update our program to be more in line with the other programs across Ontario. Um, the other improvements that we're working on and I alluded to it was a meter replacement program. So. Uh, the majority of our meters do require upgrading. Um, there are a, a limited number under 
that are within an, an acceptable range. Um, we are seeing a significant impact to our non-revenue water, so that was where our loss came in. Um, and it w the method of reading um, is walking up and doing the touchpad, and it's typically been contracted out. Um, we're seeing a significant impact. And as I noted, we did over 1,800 secondary and high reads completed um, that we, we had to go back out and, and do. So this project has been tendered and um, a recommendation will be brought forward to council um, in the April meeting. Um, another area where our staff spend quite a bit of time and it's representative of just how much work is going on within Lincoln um, is our Ontario One Call. So anytime anyone is doing any form of, if you're digging a hole within uh, a right of way, you need to have locates done. Um, so we have seen quite a steady um, increase from 2015. Um, and then as you can say, leading up to uh, leading up into the summer, we definitely have our, our spikes. And then we did have a big push for construction this year um, in November, December, and then you see that, that spike in Ontario, or in October as well. Other monitoring and improvement projects is the Vineland West private water system. It's um, currently under construction. We were anticipating originally a December um, completion date. We ran into um, some very hard ground and large boulders, which delayed a bit. And then we went into uh, the the January and February winter season that caused quite a few uh, weather delays. Um, so we are on track, all, all of the, um, it was done through um, trenchless technology, so all the drilling is now completed. We're doing um, all the, the connections now, and uh, we hope to have everyone online by mid to, to late April with restoration following immediately after. So we should be completed um, this project by spring of 2019, and the private water system will um, no longer be um, an issue, it, it will be part of our system. So to go over the staff within the Environmental Services Group, um, myself the manager of environmental services, I'm also the QMS rep um, for when we go through through audits. Um, Vanna Yu, he um, sends his regards for not be, being at the meeting, unfortunately he had to go home to uh, his kids because his wife had to work, um, but he's our regulatory compliance officer. Um, and he makes sure that everything is as needed for when we go into our audits. All of our staff um, have the training that they need, have um, any information that is required for their licenses, and that um, he is on top of all of that. Chris Shelton is our supervisor of environmental services, or our ORO, which is overall responsible operator. So if anything does go wrong, legally he is the f first person that would be um, approached if we did have a major situation. Um, currently, Nick Massey is our um, operator in charge, so he would sit um, below Chris, and in Chris's absence, he would be the acting um, overall responsible operator. And then we have um, seven operators ranging from OIT um, all the way up to class three, so we have in anticipation of becoming a class three system. Our staff have um, gone forward on their own and written the test and make, making sure that they're, um, they're set so that we can operate the system at a class three. Um, R1 OIT is set to become a, a class one operator within the upcoming months. We also work closely with technical services, roads and fleet, finance, fire, and I probably should add um, community services. Um, we work closely with uh, Dave and Ivy as well. So the DWQMS um, updates to the system kind of are an ongoing basis. Um, we have procedures new and revised. Um, Vanna updates them even as we um, get lessons learned from events. Um, we also undergo a risk assessment every year um, with Dave and, and Chris and we all sit in a room and evaluate the risk within our system. We look at trending databases, how can we improve things, um, are there any changes that we have to make to the system. Forms and record management is a big item and then obviously our annual audits um, come into a, a big role within our DWQMS to make sure that we're doing what we say we're going to be doing and that we are ensuring that um, the community is receiving that, that clean, safe drinking water. Um, we also complete an infrastructure review and management review and identify action items um, for the upcoming year. So we try to do that towards the end and then plan out the action items as, as we move forward. So the spotlight on 2019, it's, it's a busy one. Um, we have the meter replacement and AMI program. As I said, that will be coming forward in April for recommendations. The King Street water main between um, 
between Mountain View and Durham Road um, is set for, for upgrade. Um, Second Avenue Water Main. Um, we're also going to be installing some smart hydrant inserts. So these hydrant inserts will tell us um, pressure fluctuations. It'll also have uh, leak detection in it as well. So we're gonna be putting it in key areas uh, where we want, want to monitor the water mains and um, to give us forewarning of some breaks so we can deal with it while it might be a, a small little crack and then there's not the impact um, to, the, to the residents. And then of course the finalization of the Vineland West private water system. Uh, from a water quality perspective, um, we use a program called Water Tracks to, to track everything, all of our lab data, um, and then any complaints, anything like that, it all goes in. It's, it's, it's a graphical, easy way to look at it. Um, and then, as was noted too, we'll be continuing to improve our backfill program and try and bring some things more um, up to date. Um, not up to date, but it, um, following similar trends that we have seen other backfill programs go across Ontario. DWQMS, um, we are continuing to develop the wastewater QMS um, with the new provincial government. It hasn't been made clear as to what changes are going to be incorporated um, with that, that um, wastewater side. But um, a number of municipalities have identified that regardless, um, we're going to set it up and operate exactly like the water is because um, it's the best way to make sure that things are being done correctly and it's ultimately the right thing to do. Um, we also have um, a program called um, E.Riz. So as with anything, we all have a lot of, um, we get a lot of information from a lot of sources. This program brings it all into one and provides an easy way to, um, to look at how everything in the system is operating um, at a quick, a quick viewpoint um, and most of the technology that we use and other um, programs can all feed into this system and help with that. And then from a staffing perspective, we're continuing to bring um, staffing and licensing levels to, to class three and inc inc um, increase training competencies and looking at other ways to um, get the training to the, to the staff. Um, for the um, bulk fill station, we will be installing a new overhead filling arm. Um, we are being conscious of some other things and we're making sure that whatever arm we're putting in, um, if we do do any improvements to the station itself or if the station were to ever move, the filling arm um, is designed in such a way that we can relocate it and um, so that it's not a just a one system arm. Um, growth and looking forward, the beams fill, um, as was noted, we're anticipating that the beams fill system will be triggered to a class three within the next few years um, as Vista and Cherry are, are moving ahead quite well. Um, we're anticipating about 10 plus kilometers plus the all um, the associated hydrants, valves, meters, um, and all the other operational requirements um, within both Jordan and the Vineland system. Um, and we are um, monitoring kind of the, the staffing levels that we have and um, assessing kind of on, on a daily, monthly, weekly basis, how uh, how the needs as, as we're increasing is, are we handling all the work well or do we need to start looking at possibly training or bringing in um, new training as we go? Right now it's not um, anticipated that any of our staff will be retiring this year um, based on conversations. Oops, sorry. I guess I can end there, but I guess, are there any questions? Thank you very much, Jillian, for this report. Are there any questions from council? Councillor McLeod. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, uh, great report. I think uh, I almost want to pour myself a glass of water after reading that. Um, Question I have, and maybe trivial, but when when you know when you say the uh, the, the in-house audit that you did, and you had two minor non-conformances, give me an example. Can you give me an example of what would a non what, what would how critical or what, what's minor, what's major, what what's something that would have flagged your attention to that? So our one minor non-conformance um, was that we identified that we would do a mock emergency um, for vandalism and we would do it on a yearly basis, and we hadn't done it in that past, or sorry, every other year, and we hadn't done it in those two years. Um, so we had just missed it. We had our, our mock emergency scheduled for like a month later, so we were outside of that window. So it's just a minor revision.
for that. Oh, okay. So oh, that's just, I'm still going to pour myself a glass of water. <laughs> all right. That's all. Thank you. Councillor Reimer. Thank you, uh, Councillor Renee. Um, yeah, great report. Uh, I kind of take a liking to this kind of stuff more than maybe some of the other councillors. Um, just a question regarding the, the, the uh, ministry environment. When they step up to class three, is there a formula or is it strictly on like kilometers of, of water line or how do, how do they, and then what will, what will help us or what will trigger prudence? Same, same idea. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. Yes, um, it is a formula. It's based off of a point system. So the points come into play from the amount of uh, kilometers of water main, how many water mains you have over a certain size, under a certain size, um, how your pumps in the system operate, PRV. So there's, I think, about probably like 60, 70 items that you check off. Um, and then that assesses how many points you get. And then there's a range of with how many points you have, then you, you step into it. So we're not likely not going to see any major um, process changes, so we won't, um, we won't see a, ch a, a change in how the pumps are operated or things like that, but mm. where we will see the increase is the total amount of water um, on, on average over a month, our peak water usage, and then our kilometers of water main increasing. Okay. And that is going to be what pumps us up into that higher classification. Okay. So it will be once we have full build out in those that we will hit it, but Burlington will hit sooner than, than, our, than yeah. the Prudence development. Yeah, sure, okay. The beads no. will hit sooner than our Prudence development, yeah. sorry. And all, of, and all of Prudence would then, or like or is it part way through the development we would hit that f uh, class three? It might be part way through okay. um, uh, on Prudhams, but again, I don't have all of those numbers yeah. right now, so I can't do the forecasting yeah. on that. Okay. Great, thank you very much. Mayor Easton. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you, Jillian. It's a very, very good report, and when you tie it into the um, program that we take at the beginning of the of the term, uh, you begin to see how the integrity of the whole system is maintained. Um, when we discuss water at the region, we talk about, we really talk more about um, fixed and variable rates as opposed to the condition of pipes. <laughs> so Mr. Chairman, you were really talking about the impact of how much it's gonna cost us when water gets into the system um, um, and uh, and so um, I, I just want to talk about that uh, a little bit. So you, were, you showed us a graph, and I've forgotten what page it was on, that actually identified that our variable rate, our usage rate was, um, was, was that the one? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. So in Beamsville, our usage rate it's come down and it's also come down in Jordan and Vineland. And you said that that was because of low flow toilets and also smarter water use. But of course that makes our costs go up, correct? Can you just explain that again? Through you, Mr. Chair, yes, um, that is correct. That's the one downside in um, where the water professionals have, have difficulty. We wanna see, um, residents become more water smart and the usage of water go down. But again, um, at the end of the day, you're still going to have all those pipes in the ground. You're still gonna have those pipes that need to be um, improved upon. You're gonna have the plant, uh, the, the treatment plants that are gonna have the work and those costs are still there. So as the water goes down, then in, in theory, the cost per meter cubed of water um, could go up because you still have th those fixed costs. So it's it's kind of that, um, it's, a, it's a tough spot to, to promote water conservation when in the end the rates could go up because water conservation was so, so good. We haven't had um, that much of an impact. West Coast has definitely seen a lot more of that because they've gone quite on the, the extreme with the reduction in their water usage. Um, and the, the rates uh, on the West Coast of North America have gone up quite a bit. It's not as much of an impact that we, we have seen around here, but it is 
part of why rates do go up. It's one of the small factors, but it is a factor with how rates go up. The more water use goes down because there are those fixed costs that you can't okay. avoid. So Mr. Chairman, if we're not, um, you know, we really don't want this um, f um, scenario to get any more extreme than it is because it really throws off our formula that we have for, uh, for our water rates, our fixed and variable rates, our base rate and our variable rate. So now we're talking about water quality. And <clears throat> I'm not sure that I understand exactly what these one-way check valves do. I, I know a little bit more about it than I did a week ago, but I would like to talk about it on camera. I'd like you to answer some questions on camera because I really want the public to be better educated about the importance of this because it has an impact on water quality, I understand and water safety is also a factor, and it is a risk management issue for us. So when I see that there are still people that are not compliant with the check valves, and, and still more non-compliant with, with, compliant with testing, I wonder if you could give us some examples of um, breaches in the system that then could impact the quality and safety of water across the whole town. Um, through you, Mr. Chair. So I'd like to start off with just noting that um, as much as it is, I'll, I'll expand upon it as well, but um, there are, as was noted, kind of three key areas that, that regulate backflow. So any um, industrial commercial building now um, brought in or where there's work, plumbing work done on it, does require um, a backflow preventer, so it is in the building code now. There's also a CA, uh, CSA standard that identifies um, the development of, um, it's interchanged backflow and cross connection, so it's the idea of dirty water entering the clean water system. Um, there is a guideline for that. And then um, the two big events um, in, in Ontario that have driven it and have made strong recommendations by Justice O'Connor, um, and then also coming out of the review um, out of the Stratford incident. So um, Walkerton was the Justice O'Connor. So obviously um, that was a major event where um, a number of people died. It was tied to E. coli and different um, how, how water got into the system. But when he was completing the review, he realized that there was a lot of um, of industries that had a potential for water to siphon back in. So this could be anything from even being in a, um, in a restaurant kitchen and having a sink with water in it and having a hose down. If their um, water systems always have, um, when, you, when you turn on your water, you'll always see like a bit of a, a change in, in pressure on it. So you always get that fluctuation. If it does drop down and you have a hose in that water, it can be sucked back in and then that dirty kitchen water can go back into um, our drinking water system and our residents are, are consuming that. Um, another um, place that it can happen just in, in regular operations. A lot of um, industries use water just for their operations. There's a chance that it gets, gets back in. Um, and even within washrooms, it can be um, it can be an issue. Any any time that you have a sink, any time that there is it, um, potential for it, a hose or a water source to be submerged in water to pull it back in it is the point. Um, the the biggest one and where I think every municipality strives to have their numbers um, is is Stratford. So in twenty uh, in two thousand five, and it, it was highlighted in in our meeting in December, um, there was a, a car wash and they didn't have a backflow preventer on it and their, um, their water and soap from the car wash actually went back into the system in Stratford and the entire city lost um, access to water while they tried to remove um, that contaminant from, from the system. Since that incident, Stratford has had a 100% um, installation rate and a 100% annual testing. Um, performance since then. A number of the communities around Stratford have also realized high 90s for um, both events because they've seen the impact. Um, it, it, is a, it is a true, a true risk um, and the, the idea of having the backflow preventer in, in there is, is to prevent it from our highest risk sources. Um, every um, 
every property that does have a backflow preventer installed and and part of it is um, you have to have a risk assessment done on your site. Um, the town doesn't do that risk assessment. It's actually um, a licensed plumber that is licensed in the backflow um, area that completes the risk assessment and identifies how many backflows you need um, for your property, whether it's not, it's just a individual perimeter protection. Um, they might also say that just to protect the residents within um, your building as well for the water use, at specific points, you might also need backflow preventers. So, um, there's a number of, of properties within Lincoln that have more than one backflow preventer, but some only need the perimeter protection because that risk within their building isn't as high. Um, so that's to try and answer a bit of, of, of the question. Um, it is just a, a very, um, it's, the, the backflow itself is a low probability, but it's an extremely high consequence. So it is a, um, a high risk event with the, with the right, backflow. Right. Okay, Mr. Chairman, I just wanted to ask a question about groundwater then. So is groundwater likely to find its way into the water pipes or more likely to find its way into the um, waste, um, waste management pipes, the sewer pipes? Through you, Mr. Chair. Yes, um, it's more likely to enter into the um, the sanitary sewers. So, um, w water mains are constructed more in um, in a single fashion. They're also um, designed to be under pressure. So, all the seals on them are are, are significantly tighter um, than what you would see on on um, <coughs> on a sewer system. And then, because they are primarily under pressure, it would it would have a tendency to push the water out of the pipe instead of allow um, it to come in, and that's the intent as well with with water mains to, to keep them safe, is to have that outflow. Again, there, there can be situations where it might <coughs> um, decrease, but that would be where leak detection comes in and identifying where those sources are in, in advance and making those repairs. Um, but it's more, to answer your question, it's more likely to go into a sewer system than it would into a water system. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'll try and remember all these technical details. Thank you. Councillor Timmers. Thank you, Chair Brown. Good afternoon. Pardon? I'm on now. Thank you, Chair Brunet. <clears throat> really good report. Excellent. Um, the report's coming back. We are obviously in very good shape very few, very few um, complaints. Um, the whole thing about water makes me think about Camden, where we have no water. And I, I don't know if this is appropriate to bring it up here, but I think we're talking about water and water systems. Um, up in, you know, Camden, we, we have no water, but yet we have a fire hydrant out on Victoria Avenue. What can it, what would it take to get water from a ministry point of view or health and safety point of view to get water brought into that hamlet. We we've currently have almost 80 homes that are gonna be either are built or are coming. And that puts our urban, just in our urban area, 160 homes approximately when they're all built out. That's just the urban boundary area. So I guess my question is how do we get the region to come down Fly Road with water for that, that area? I, I may be putting you on the spot, but I, I guess I'm looking for just some kind of, is there a ministry, environment, yep. health and safety angle? I don't know. I'm just putting it out there, just if, I, if you don't have an answer for me, that's okay, but I just wanna I, I, talk I think, about it. I think that's a, pretty, uh, that's a pretty, I mean, that's a very, very important question. And I think it's something that we need to talk about. So maybe at a very high level and maybe if, uh, Director Graham wants to chime in, but I think that is a conversation for a full, a full report that we need to, to bring forward. But I appreciate the, the question. So while it's on the floor, uh, Jillian, if you want to make a very quick comment, or Director Graham. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. That is a, an excellent um, question indeed. I think that we can log it. The biggest thing would be um, kind of putting pressure on the region to support that. Uh, one of the biggest limitations is to get water to that point. It's going through um, the green belt and dealing with what is required with that to extend it out into that um, kind of that urban area. There's, um, 
I believe, and you can possibly expand on this a little bit further, I think it's outside of, I think even all of Camden, even in that urban bit, is outside of um, our urban boundary that we're allowed to put utilities in. The reason that they're sewers was it was ministry mandated because of some of the, the leaching that was happening from the septic tanks into the groundwater that was there. Um, but Dave can expand it a bit more, but ultimately the, the short answer is it's putting pressure on the region to, to support the idea of water going to that point. Uh, through Mr. <coughs> Chairman to the councillor and just kind of echoing on what Jillian was saying. So there isn't really a health issue currently there with water. Um, the sewers went in because old septic systems were failing. So the town back a number of years ago, probably 15, almost 20 years ago, were actually ordered by the Ministry of Environment to install sewers because of failing septic systems. So um, <clears throat> there isn't a, a current health risk as it relates to water. Um, it would be a, a pretty big undertaking, obviously, to cost-wise to get water out to Camden. Um, you know, it's quite a bit of, uh, everything's fed from the top of the hill at Victoria Avenue and Fifth uh, Avenue, where the reservoir is. So. Again, it would be working with the region <clears throat> if this was a concept to pursue. You know, can they even supply water out that out to Camden? Um, but again, it, it's something that can be talked about. You know, moving forward and further conversations. Um, currently, uh, <coughs> excuse me. Currently, uh, Camden is serviced by private cisterns, um, and, and that's kind of been uh, the uh, direction, I guess, as it relates to how it's going to be developed. Uh, that people will be on private cisterns. Okay, well, I, I appreciate your comments. I know I just, we're talking about water, so I thought this is the time, the opportunity to maybe put it on the floor. Um, I just wondered if there was anything with built, you know, we are building all those new houses at, with cisterns. So um, I just, I'm looking at the Vineland West private water system, and I, I guess I, I can't help but compare you know, the private, that area down there. And um, anyway, I do appreciate your comments. And um, thank you. Thank you, Chair Bernay. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Russell, you're, you're okay? Okay. Councillor Mickelock. Uh, thank you, Chair. Through you to Jillian. Um, the mayor had alluded a little bit to the backflow um, issue. So with regards to backflow, is this mandated by the province that every municipality has backflow or is this uh, a municipality's choice to implement a backflow procedure? It is mandated through building code that they, um, that they have to be installed. Um, it is strongly recommended and without having a regulation requiring it um, for it to be installed, short of maybe a few very north municipalities. There is not a single one in Ontario that does not have a program. Lincoln was actually early with bringing it forward, but every other municipality has not brought up. It wouldn't be something to... Um, as a municipality, it would not be something in the water world to be proud of to not have a system, to be one of the communities that doesn't have a system and do it, because it is your due diligence of protecting it. But now that we have it in our system, under our DWQMS, it now is required and regulated. So, so if we have this bylaw, we have this, uh, and we have these um, non-compliance, uh, what, what is the consequence for failure to comply? Either with annual testing or with installation or uh, at all? So currently the consequence as per the existing bylaw is that the water is shut off. Obviously that comes with, um, it's difficult as a municipality when it's, it's businesses that employ your residents. Um, to, to shut off water for that. That's why we're looking at bringing forward the bylaw um, and bringing it more in line with what the other municipalities have brought forward, looking at um, instead of your water being cut off, more similar to um, you're looking at fines or other co consequences that actually hit more, um, are a bit easier to enforce as opposed to 
shutting off the water on a, on a business that does employ a number of people within the community. But it's something, that's why we're bringing it forward to have that discussion um, in the upcoming months. Okay, so this, this could be part of the problem is that, <coughs> you know, why comply if there's no real consequence or um, reason to comply, you know, other than you, you said so. Um, may, maybe we need to look at a little bit at that, perhaps. Through you, Mr. I would, I would agree. It's something that we have to, to, to look at, um, and, and, and move forward with, with enforcement of, of some form. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Patriva. Thank you, Chair Brene, and I'd like to echo Councillor Mikuluk's comments. I'd like to take a harder line in the sand. I don't care for the SNC Lavalin. Um, argument that there's jobs and and uh, you know at risk. You know what? There's people health, people's health at risk, and we saw the situation in Stratford. That what the consequences can be. We are all responsible to deliver clean water. We are held liable. Turn the water off, and they will quickly comply. Mary Easton. Well, if that's a very good statement, Mr. Chairman, and um, this is a good time to discuss this because I'm sure that if we said to the staff there is to be 100% compliance by X date, that they wouldn't have any difficulty going out. So I guess maybe before making a, you know, a, before we have a motion here, um, maybe we should ask what's involved in doing that, or we can wait for another time because this is really just about. Um, this report, um, and you may wish um, at, at uh, your own pleasure, Mr. Chairman, to bring that that piece forward uh, in order uh, if staff are looking for a direction, uh, maybe it's time to do that. I mean, this is now, is it five years or pretty close to five years? Yep. Through you, Mr. Chairman, Ms. Harris, is it five years since we've been implementing yes, this? Yes, through you, Mr. Chair, I believe it's five okay, years. Okay, so our, would, you, would your advice to Council through you, Mr. Chairman, be that we have, we have um, exercised all of the tolerance that um, should be expected and that it's time now to move forward to 100% compliance? Through you, Mr. Chair, I would like to hit 100% compliance. It's, it's their clear direction and support for following our current bylaw and the implications of that. Okay, so we have the bylaw in place. All right, is there something that council can do to help you with that through you, Mr. Chairman? I'm gonna lean on Dave a little bit here. <laughs> Director Graham. Uh, thank you, through you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Just to add a couple comments. So. You know, we, we've been uh, talking to other municipalities who have, you know, are going through similar situations where, um, <clears throat> like I think for Lincoln, if we go back to the graph, um, we're almost there with having people get the actual device into their system, <clears throat> which is really important. Um, but we're struggling to get people to continue to comply, or at least that's where we're seeing where we're getting less compliance in doing their annual testing. So if you put in a device, um, you're required to test it annually <coughs> just to make sure it works. There's no use having a device in if it doesn't work. So it's the testing um, <clears throat> of the device that, you know, we really need to look at how we're going to get better compliance with. Um, so what we're, what we're going to do probably maybe in the next two months is bring a, a bylaw amendment forward. And because we've talked to some other municipalities and they said, well, you, what's been successful for them in getting more compliance is actually charging a fee. Um, opposed to just shutting water off. Um, so we want to we want to have some more flexibility to give staff a little more uh, s support in terms of compliance. Um, so we're going to be bringing a report back to committee to have that more focused conversation on how we uh, improve compliance with the backflow um, program. And I guess we'll be looking for committee support to, to kind of beef that up, if you will. Um, with fines, et cetera. 
and, and that's kind of what other municipalities, you know, we're trying to learn from others who are a bit ahead of us in this, in this game as, as it relates to compliance issues. So I think committee can expect a, a report in the next couple months uh, looking at how we can really shore up the enforcement and the compliance um, because yeah, staff, we, we wanna, we want to improve the gap with, uh, you know, getting people to test it annually. We're seeing that drop a little bit. So, Mr. Chairman, I would say that um, um, knowing that we are ultimately responsible, accountable legally for water quality, and because it's not possible for council to judge while we're sitting around the table what those which companies would be high risk to contribute to such a failure of our system, I really, do, I don't think that we have any choice, but I'd certainly, you know, I'll, I'll you know, I think that we can certainly wait for the report. I hope that, that there's no um, risk in waiting for, for that report, but if we don't have this, if, if we know what our responsibilities and accountabilities are, and we don't have a system that's wholesome in terms of what it's offering and what it's monitoring, then we remain at risk. That's how I would interpret that. So unless I'm off track, and I could very well be, I'm concerned about us not having 100% compliance after five years, that, that's a bit of a concern. Well, I think you're absolutely right on, uh, Mayor. Uh, and that's, that's, I mean, that's 70% compliance. That number, that really hasn't, that needle hasn't really changed much. No. And uh, I, I do believe what, Dr., what uh, Director Graham, um, you know, indicated. Like, you know, it's one thing to go out and say you're going to turn a person's water off, but I think there's some teeth in. I know we've got facilities in the region of Halton on Harvester Road in Burlington and Steeles Avenue in Milton, and we get it. We get an annual notification that say, you know, they expect us to do uh, testing by a certain date, and if we don't do it, there'll be a fee. We don't pay the fee. We we do the annual testing. Like, so you have that choice. You pay the fee, pay the fee or Somebody's going to come out and do it. You're going to you're going to pay for it anyway. So, uh, I, I think there's some teeth there, and I, I think it's um, I think it's time that we need to do that. And it sounds like Dir Director Graham is working on that. So, uh, appreciate you bringing that up, Mayor. Thank you very much, Councillor Mickluck. Thank you very much. One one more. Just keep dragging this one on. But uh, I have another question to Director Graham. So we have these. Uh, you know these these, in, these these companies that are failing to comply. They're either choosing not to comply or can't comply. Um, have we reached out to those that are not in compliance to get feedback as to why they are not complying, or is it just a, a disdain for the system? Is it uh, a refusal to want to pay for the cost? Is it a uh, um, a possibility that they're they're not in compliance. Have we have we polled uh, or contacted these individuals? Who wants to touch that one? Director Graham. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. <clears throat> I'll maybe I'll take a stab at it at the beginning, and maybe Jillian can add some more comments. Uh, we have been in conversations with them. Yes, um, and we're looking at ways we can help sort of incrementally get some compliance uh, moving. Uh, some of the facilities are a little more challenging uh, and costly. So, you know, those are some of the factors that some of those property owners are dealing with. Um, so we are doing, you know, looking at how can we get them to start moving towards compliance. Um, I know since last year we, we did, uh, the numbers up at 95%. So we, there has been people, we have moved I think it's important to know over the last year, we've moved quite a few people to compliance compared to last year, um, but there are still some remaining ones that we, we do have to tackle for sure. I don't know, Jillian, if you wanna add any more. To yeah, um, so just to expand on what Dave was saying, he was more addressing that remaining 14 properties. The 70% compliance with testing, um, in the past year we've moved to a more robust system of actually tracking. Um, before it was a, a paper copy came in, some things were, were shuffled around. It wasn't a, a fully accurate system. This is the first year where we're seeing actual true numbers. Um, so this number has decreased from what we would have seen in, in previous years because we do have the tracking of the testing. Um, now that we have a year's worth of data, this is where we will start going out and, and talking to them. So they have received, um, they've all received three notices 
um, to get it. But now it's this year as part of the program, we'll be going out and advi advising more in a um, in-person way that testing is required annually um, and the importance of testing because a lot of people think that once you put it in the ground that, it, that it's fine, but it's like any other device. It's, there's water flowing through it every, every day. So like any, anything else that has seals or um, mechanical parts, it's, it does take wear and tear and it does need to do testing. We did have one backflow device that did require replacement within town last year. Um, and um, it, it did fail outright um, and was a, a, an emergency repair that was needed, but testing would have, um, testing captures kind of that pre um, eminent portion as well. Okay, that's good, thank you. Well, thank you very much, Jillian, for your report. I just wanted to make one quick comment. Uh, I know you mentioned that uh, you don't expect anyone retiring this year, but I do believe that, uh, you know, as manager and as director and as council, uh, I do believe we have been very cognizant in terms of um, making sure that we're looking at succession planning and, you know, putting in, um, um, you know, uh, Vanna in that position. Um, we didn't have that position a few years ago, and so we looked at that, and we now have operator and training, and we are looking at core competencies and increasing levels and moving people up from operator and training to level one, to level two, level three. So um, I do believe that we are looking at succession training and, 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 and planning and training. So uh, we're not having anybody retiring this year, but uh, w I think we are looking at it, so I wanted to just acknowledge that. Thank you very much for your report. Uh, being no, no further discussion, we do have a motion. Uh, the motion to receive and file the Public Works Report PW-04-19 regarding the water distribution to Beamsville and Jordan Vineland, January 1st, 2018 to December 31st, 2018. Uh, Councillor Pachariva is, is a mover for the motion. All in favor? And that is passed. We are now considering item 7.3, PW-06-19, the Town of Lincoln Drinking Water Quality Management System, DWQWM Operational Plan Reendorsement. This was in your package. Are there any questions from Council? Seeing a no further discussion, uh, we have a, mo a motion to approve the 2019 Town of Lincoln Dry Drinking Water Quality Management System, DWQMS, Operation Plan Reendorsement. We require a motion, a mover for that motion. Councillor McPherson, all in favor? And that is passed. We have no confidential items this evening. Are there any staff remarks? Seeing none, do we have any committee remarks? There being no further business, I call this meeting adjourned. <laughs>